<laughs> long as it's not on, you know, time lapse. Or it's on photo. <laughs> <laughs> We've done that before. Well, actually, we had. I've done that before. Okay, so we're going to start a new, uh, completely new stuff. But I'm going to give you some background and some intro first of all before we get right into the new stuff. So first of all, I'm going to give you a definition. Exponential order. Now the term order, for a lot of people, is kind of a vague, ambiguous term, but it actually is a very mathematical term that makes it fairly simple to understand. I'm going to use two examples, chemistry and physics. Or actually, I should say chemistry and astronomy. In chemistry, you work with very small things, right? Electrons. So when you say, how big are electrons, we say they are on the order of, what, 10 to the negative 23rd power in terms of their mass? Yeah. But if I'm talking about distances to other galaxies or other stars, we might be on the order of you know, 10 to the 15th power. 10. So when you say order, you're usually referring in that case to the exponent. You're on the order of. Does it really matter what the number in front is? No. No, it's, you really think about that exponent. So exponential order is similar, where I'm actually looking at an exponent, but it, it's basically a bound. So the idea is, I have some function, we're, we're actually going to be using t's now for our, for our things. I have some function f of t, and I'm going to compare it to m, e, now in the, let me see, I'm going to use the same letters of the alphabet that the author uses, sorry. The letters of the alphabet are, are irrelevant in the long run. Uh, he uses, sorry, it's too small, he uses a c. Okay, he uses a c. All right? So something is of exponential order if I can bound it where m and c are positive real numbers, but they could be any positive real numbers. There's no restriction on them. So for example, if I said, well, f of t is, you know, t to the fourth power plus a thousand. Well, let's see. So I'll make a thousand right here. How about? So this is going to go up really fast. Can I come up with an M and a T that's always above this? No. Well, I said less than or equal. So what would a good M be? Two thousand. How about a thousand? How about even a thousand? And what should I? How about for my C? I'll make it. I don't know. Just to be safe, you know, ten. <laughs> so what's that one going to look like? Well, it's probably going to go. You know, You'll make that sound when it goes. It's, it's pretty easy that if I give you a polynomial, it would be very easy to find an exponential function that's always above it. Mm -hmm. Sine and cosine, my God, that's the easiest one of all. Sine and cosine is always going to be below that, isn't it? Yeah. So every function that I can bound with this exponential, we say the function is of exponential order. What we're going to look at today are only functions that are of exponential order, only functions that can be bounded. And I'm only looking at the positive side. So can anybody think of a function that can't be bounded by an exponential? Mm. That'd be, yeah, everything would be bounded, right? Uh-oh, he went toward his left eye. You know something's up. Yeah, there I have something in my eye. How about if my f of t was, I don't know, 1 over t? Uh, you know, ink, mm. ink, ink. Right, psycho scene, shower, you know, stabbing you over and over again, you freak out. Um, what's the problem? It diverges. Well, yeah, but it, it doesn't matter how high I start. <laughs> <laughs> I have a vertical asymptote for the y-axis. Is there any exponential that's going to be above this? No. No. So this would not be of exponential order. So to keep it simple, what kind of things are of exponential order? Let's see. Polynomialish things, sines and cosines, exponential functions. Hmm. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> it's like, was that, a, was that an oda on the way? Yeah, the things that are of exponential order are the exact same things we've been using all along. Okay? Good mind. Oh, I thought I was draining my attention there. You make all sorts of hand gestures. So, <laughs> If a function is of exponential order, that means it can be bound by an exponential function, which now means we can consider it in what we're going to be doing today. If something's not of exponential order, it's not that 
you can never use it. It's just it's very limited now with the things we're going to use today because I, I can't use it all the time. So, for example, how about a logarithm? Would that be of exponential order? Uh, yeah, yeah sure. but it, it actually might not be useful for what we're doing. Hmm. How about an inverse tan? Yes. Inverse tan's going like that. Yeah, that's really easy to bound. But I might not need it for what we're doing. It, it may be more complicated than I need. So basically right now, the big four are, and those are the things we're going to look at over and over again. Okay. So with that in mind, I'm going to do one simple proof that's actually very powerful because we use this. We have something called the gamma function. Yes. I've made reference to this before. Does anybody know what a capital gamma looks like? Yeah, like an inverse L. <laughs> oh, I'm more thinking of a game. Oh, the hangman? It looks like a hangman, yeah. It looks, I don't know, I, I think it looks like a hangman. You guys ever play hangman? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a hangman. So we want to define this. First rule is alpha has to be greater than zero. Okay? So alpha has to be greater than zero, and the definition of the gamma function is Hold on a second. Um, yeah, make sure I wrote it down correctly. It's zero to infinity, t to the alpha minus one, e to the negative t dt. So that's that's pretty easy antiderivative, right? My independent variable is t, e yeah. to the negative tt. That's an integration by parts at the very least, except that alpha yes. doesn't even have to be an integer. Right. Oh. In fact, if alpha is not an integer, it's not actually yeah. possible to do this problem. But we're going to do it anyway. Okay. <laughs> today in my count two class, all we did today was look at integrals that have no antiderivatives, evaluated at numbers that were not actually in their domain, and then we did it anyway. But we did sine x over x from 0 to any constant you wanted. We did 1 minus cosine x over x squared from 0 to any constant. And we got answers, and then we checked them on Wolfram to show that I do a few terms of a power series and get, you know, double digit decimal accuracy. So I was showing them this is actually what the whole point of learning series is, so you can do integrations of things that have no antiderivatives, but give answers anyway. And then one of them we did was just for fun on, on Wolfram, we did, and it gave the usual, you know, seven answers, four of them complex, but it gave symbols they'd never heard of or never seen. <laughs> they were really fun, because you're an engineer, you might see them. They were very funny things. People look at it going, what does that even mean? Well, it, it extremely obscure stuff because it couldn't actually give the answer. And then we did it anyway. Yeah, this can't be integrated, so let's do it anyway. It's an improper integral. So right off the bat, if you remember, I've got to do the limit as, well, I won't use t, I'll say as c goes to 0 of 0 to c, because you can't evaluate at infinity, because you can't get to infinity. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the general antiderivative off to the side and then bring the answer back. Because this is going to involve techniques, it's going to involve an integration by parts and other things. It's really hard to keep track of the terms in a definite integral when you're taking the limit of your limit and performing techniques. Uh, should it be the limit? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, not zero. Not zero. All right. So let's just do the general antiderivative first. Well, I can make either one of these be the u because I can integrate and differentiate both. But if you remember a rule of thumb, when you had a transcendental function and a polynomialish function, you always made which one u? The polynomial. The polynomial, because the exponents are easier to work with. But that was only if you could do both. If that was a natural log, for example, then that would have to be the u because you don't know it's antiderivative. So we're going to make the u be the t term. then my dv will be e to the negative t dt. Then my du will be this, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said that back. Uh, Let's differentiate. I'm, I'm sorry, you know what? Minus. Yes, this, I went the wrong way, sorry. Um, I'm gonna do something else in a moment. Sorry about that. And then my v is this. Now, here's the problem. When I rewrite it, this part's fine, oh. but now that's my integral. 
which just got worse. And we're not used to the integral getting worse, are we? Now, I just said we could go either way. And so what I do in my Calc 2 class on the very first time we do this, I take a problem where we could go either way, and of course I start by going the other way. And then they get a problem going, that's worse than the original question. We must have done it wrong. No, we just made the wrong choice. So we're going to go the other way. And it might not be obvious to you why it's the wrong choice, but I'm going to have the same thing with now this exponent being one less than it was before, and that's not really helpful. So you wouldn't know that unless you actually tried it. So this is what's unusual, is that I'm going to choose this guy, and my dv I'm going to make be the t to the alpha minus 1. And now my v is t to the alpha 1 over alpha. And this is obviously so much better. Well, not yet, but it will be. So uv minus the integral of v du, but there was already a minus sign, so it'll be plus, and that would be, I'll put the 1 over alpha in front, t to the alpha e to the negative t dt. Okay? Now, I want to start with this guy. Because remember, the whole thing was the, we did this. So I'm going to do the limit as c goes to infinity of 1 over alpha t to the alpha e to the negative t from 0 to c. I'm just doing that guy first because I want to get this out of the way. And then that will be 1 over alpha times the limit as c goes to infinity. How about if I write that as c to the alpha over e to the c? Would that be correct if I wrote it that way? Mm -hmm. um, doesn't matter if alpha is big. Let's suppose alpha is a large integer. Then I would do L'Hopital's rule exactly alpha times. I'd get an alpha factorial on top. And the bottom would still be growing without bounds, so that limit is zero. If alpha, let's say, was some number of halves, let's say alpha was six and a half, well, then I do L'Hopital's rule seven times, mm -hmm. and then it would end up on the bottom, and now the bottom's still going to infinity, which means, in other words, e to the t is bigger, so it feels bigger. this is zero. You have an exponential, and you have a polynomial ish. It's, a, it's actually a very simple proof. If alpha is a positive integer, then exactly alpha. L'Hopital's rules leaves alpha factorial, right? Not c, but alpha factorial on top, which is a constant. The bottom's growing without bound. Again, if it's a fractional one, do one more, and then it ends up on the bottom with a positive fractional exponent. Either way, that's zero. Meaning this part is no longer part of my answer. Uh, so now I can say my answer is the limit of c goes to infinity of what? Of the other thing. 1 over alpha, oh, I'm sorry, where is it? Um, the integral, I can't of, uh, integral, there we go. 0 to c. 0 to c of t to the alpha e to the negative t dt. Does everybody agree that the first part is 0? Yes. So, you know, I changed my mind. I don't, I don't. See, I was right. I, I, have to, I, I don't feel like integrating this anymore. So how about if I just say it's, it's just this. I'm just, I'm just going to leave it like that for a moment. Only a moment. There's a song. Only for a moment, and the moment's gone. It's a famous song. You know what that song? Dust in the Wind. Dust in the Wind, exactly. I love that song. OK. Why is this important? Isn't there supposed to be a negative sign somewhere? No, because it was minus the negative. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that. What is this equal to? This is equal to 1 over alpha gamma alpha plus 1. Why? Because the definition of gamma of alpha is this. So therefore, the definition of gamma of alpha plus 1 would be I just increase that by 1. 
Well, why is that a good thing? Because you're right, I never actually act really integrated it. But what I've just proved is one of the more important results Okay. I may not know what the antiderivative of the gamma function is, but I do know that statement is true. Now, let's choose a value for alpha. What would be a really good value to choose for alpha? Zero. One. How about one? Oh, that's zero. No, it's not zero. God, no. How about, how about one? One. <laughs> you all agree one might be a better choice? If I choose... I want the gamma function of one. Well, that'd be the improper integral of just e to the negative t dt, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that means I've got the limit as c goes to infinity of negative e to the negative t evaluated from zero to c, which is negative e to the negative c plus one. That goes to zero rapidly, and that answer is? What? One. one. Huh. Gamma of one is one. Well, what's gamma of two? Two. Careful. No. That means alpha is one. So won't gamma of two, sorry, right here, be gamma of two will be one times gamma of one. Oh. Which is still one. But then what's gamma of three? <laughs> oh, it's two. What's gamma of three? Well, that would be two times gamma of two, which is two. two. What's gamma of four? That's three times gamma of three, which now gives me six. I'll do one more. What's gamma of five? Well, that's four times gamma of four, which is four factorial. So for integer value of alpha, this is where the factorials come from. I've, I've mentioned that to you before, but now I've just proved it. If alpha is an element of the, um, I said the, sm the smallest we would use would actually be a one. Okay, so I'll, I'll write it like that. Then this is equal to that. Um, is there a reason why we define the gamma function to be at alpha minus one? Well, because we, it can also, it doesn't have to be an integer. Gamma just, excuse me, alpha just had to be positive. It didn't oh. have to be an integer. So the gamma function can be used if I want to use decimal values or halves or things like that. Probably halves more likely than anything else. Now, if this is correct, what did we just prove that gamma of one is? We just derived it. We integrated to get this, by the way. I didn't tell you this is actually the result of the integration. But gamma of one is the equivalent of zero, zero factorial. factorial. Most everybody, when I say, what's zero factorial? You go, oh yeah, yeah, they told us in stats or maybe algebra or even in calculus, zero factorial is one. And I'll say, well, how does it, every person I've ever known says, well, it's, it's just defined to be one. We don't question it, it just is one because we're told it's one, it's defined to be one. No, it's not defined to be one at all. It's calculated to be one. Zero factorial is actually a calculation. We just did it. So the, it's defined to be one is because the person didn't understand where it came from. It comes from the gamma function, and it actually is a calculation. Now, zero factorial being one is an important result, but it's not a random arbitrary result that we just, hey, let's just call it one. No, it's, it's a calculation. We just did it. We just proved it. Yeah, so the gamma function is a very useful function, and we're going to use it to derive another thing. But I said there's a couple of things in here that we don't do yet. So the next thing that goes along with this, we're not gonna do for a couple weeks. It, it's, we don't need it for a couple weeks, okay? So did they find like, the factorial solution? I'm sorry, say again? Did, did, they, like, did they find the gamma function first or like the factorial function? Did they, um, I'm, I'm sure the gamma function came first, but there was reason to come up with the factorial function because the question obviously is, well, for integer values of alpha, I can do cool things. Um, remember, this stuff came long before your ability to go to Wolfram and calculate it. Oh, okay. I, I don't know how many years, but if you said a couple hundred, I'd say, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, this is not new stuff, but our ability to do this is kind of cool. Now, 
the point of today's stuff we're doing today is all going to involve improper integrals. Everything's going to be infinite in nature, but it also has to be things that are of exponential order. Now, by the way, is this of exponential order? Only if, only if alpha is 1, or greater than 1. Yeah, it's only of exponential order if alpha is greater than 1. Everybody got that? That's, that's very important. Now, I'm going to move on to the next thing, because now we're going to define something called the Laplace yes. transform. Yes. Now, I mentioned last day that it's a type of transformation. And there are, there are an infinite number of types of transformations, but there are some that are very important. Every time you did a U substitution in Calc 1, that's a transformation. You did a trig sub in Calc 2, that's a transformation. You did a polar substitution in, in Calc 3, that's a transformation. That's just a two-dimensional one. Oh, cylindrical coordinates, right? Spherical coordinates, that's a transformation in 3D. There's an infinite number of transformations. I could say, I want to do a reflection of something. That's a type of transformation. I want to do something rotational. So this is a type of transformation that takes us from one space to another space. And the way we write it is like this. And, and we use a script L to indicate that it's a Laplace transform. So we say the Laplace transform, and strangely enough, we don't use parentheses. I wasn't there when the World Math Council decided on the notation. So this is literally the only time in mathematics where we use set notation instead of parentheses. <clears throat> now that looks really scary at first. But depending on what the f of t is, remember it's one of the big four, we absolutely can do the problem. The only one that we cannot do today, we cannot do f of t if t is raised to a power. If it's t to a power, that's actually the fourth lecture. And then I'm going to come back and borrow stuff from this section to do that lecture. That's the only one we can't do today, but we can do f of t of f of t of sine t, cos t, or e to any power. What's the variable that's next to the t in e to s. s? S. It's an s. Now, here's the interesting thing. We're going to actually do a few from beginning to end. Um, right now, t is my independent variable. I'm going to do a whole bunch of stuff, and then I'm going to evaluate it. Is my answer going to be a number? No. No, what's it going to be? Function of s. It's going to be a function of s. Ooh. So we give that a name. We call this capital F of s, to distinguish it from little f. Little f of t is in one universe. I run the Laplace transform, and I get big F of S. And so our point is to learn how to do Laplace transforms, come up with formulas for each of the major functions, and then manipulate. I want you to liken today's lecture as you're learning how to do the derivatives. We're not doing any derivatives. But what's a higher level than derivatives? Integrals. Integrals. In baby algebra, you learn how to multiply polynomials. So then later you could be given a polynomial and say, where did it come from? That's factoring. That's a much higher level of thinking. Integration is a much higher level than differentiation. I can give you any function, you can differentiate it mindlessly. But if I give you a function and say, where did it come from? That can be taxing. So today we're learning how to do the Laplace transform to get the big F. What do you think we're going to do later? Get the Start with the big F and say, where did it come from? That's a higher level of thinking. That's why we have to do this first. So this is more in line with learning derivatives. And then the next thing would be like antiderivatives because we're going to do the inverse operation. The inverse operation is always a higher level of thinking. Factoring versus multiplying out. Integration versus differentiating. Inverse Laplace transform versus Laplace transform. The, the going forward is going to be rather mindless once we establish a set of rules, just like derivatives. If I know all of the derivatives of every function, I don't really have to think very hard unless there was like a product rule or something. That's not even a thing in this case. So I'm assuming the reason why we cared about bounding functions with exponentials is because if our function cannot be bounded, then that integral would diverge? Exactly. Okay. That's, that's exactly what's going on. It, it either would be a, a DNE or be infinity, but either way, it wouldn't be something clear and finite. So the exponential order part was actually critical. And we're so limited with what we can do. And here's the thing. We know, we know how to do integration by parts in general. But integration by parts can be really nasty if one of your functions is not 
but well behaved. So we don't really work with like a log in this case, or an inverse tan in this case. We don't. We stick with the big four. For like derivatives, that's like finding area derivatives and integrals, like area under a curve, that stuff. What is like what clause? Well, we're to? we're not going to give it any any. When you first learn derivatives, you learn how to do the derivative, and then eventually you went to the application. Okay. So we use Laplace for a lot of things. If I can't do a problem directly, um, actually probably an easier analogy in Calc 3. You learn polar transformation because you're looking at the rectangular integral that you cannot do. But then when you switched it to polar, all of a sudden it was easy to do. If it was a definite integral, you just answered it. If it was indefinite, then you switched it back at some point. But you changed to a different universe because that problem was easier to do. That, that's, that's literally all you're doing. Why did you do a U sub in Calc 1? Because you couldn't do the problem you were asked, but if you did this substitution, this transformation, you now made it into something you could do. That's what a Laplace transform literally is. I'm, I'm taking something that could be nasty and converting it into something that might be easier. And then maybe I convert it back, maybe I leave it the way it was, depending on the overall use. We are just doing the early stages of the process. If you went on and took an upper division version, you'd probably go much more in depth. We are, we are doing very little in the application realm. This is just the how-to part. So if you think of calculus, you always do applications at the very end. But you can't do an application until you know how to do the derivative or how to do the integral. So I'm concentrating more on the how-to part right here. So let's start. We'll do, we're going to do a few different ones. We'll start with the, the easiest one. And that is we want to do the Laplace transform of E to the kt, where k is any real number. So our final answer probably has a k in it, doesn't it? Probably has a k in it, so it's, I'm not giving you a specific value of k. This is the easiest of all of them. So 0 to infinity, e to the kt, e to the negative st, dt. So right off the bat, I'm going to change this because it is an improper integral and I can't do it. In, I can't evaluate it at infinity. That's not even a thing. So 0 to c now. Can I make that prettier? Sure. k minus s all the time. Well, it's kt minus st. And I can certainly factor out the t. But do I want to factor out the t? Mm -hmm. Maybe do I want to factor out the negative t? Um, so you, about now you should be saying, oh yes, that's what I really want to do. In other words, would that be the same thing? Yeah. That's what we want to do. Because that's the thought you were having. Exactly what you were thinking we should do. And this will somehow make it easier in the end? Is that what? Yeah. Okay. It'll make it, no, that's probably the only, it'll make it more useful. Okay. It, it'll be easier to determine what the final answer actually is if I write it in this form, as it turns out. Okay. Okay. It's not more or less correct, though. Now, I have e to the thing. Is that an easy integration? By the way, as far as t is concerned, s and k are just constants, aren't they? Everybody understand? They're just constants as far as t is concerned. Okay, so this is the limit as c goes to infinity of, what's the antiderivative of this? Negative 1 over x minus k, e to the negative x. And I'm evaluating from 0 to c. In fact, if you want, I can do this, couldn't I? Yeah. Did I write that? Um, no, I'm sorry. Minus, sorry, minus one, not plus one. Hmm. I do need brackets here because it's being multiplied by the other thing. I'd really like that to be zero. Is that always zero? You're talking about the argument within the yeah. limit? I, I, I want the limit. I want that limit. Well, that's not going anywhere. No. I want that limit to be zero. Is it always zero? Should be, right? Well, how about if I wrote it as 1 over e to the s minus k? Would that be the same thing? 
times C. Would that be the same? As C grows without bound, I want my denominator to grow without bound, therefore the whole quantity approaches zero. Because what's the other option? It's it blows, going to infinity. I'd really like it to go to zero. Yeah. So then if you were to take out not a negative T from the beginning, then it, it would just be in the numerator? Well, it'd be, it'd be a little more, I'd have more negatives mm -hmm. in the statement than I really want. Oh, but eventually it'll get to this. Eventually, yeah. Okay. If s is less than k, would it? Be oh, it has something to do with that, doesn't it? k is a constant that's given. k is given. K, k is the number three. You know, k is a constant. You're not worried about k. I need this to go to zero. When will this go to zero? Only if s is greater than, is greater than k. So we have to add these. So, first of all, what's the answer? <laughs> That's good. Nice. That's the answer. That has to be included in the statement. Think of it this way. S can be any real number. S can be anything on the number line. But this integral only converges to 1 over S minus K if S is bigger than K. All other times, it diverges. Okay. The Laplace transform doesn't work for anything that has a diverging function. It, I'm yeah, confused. It by had to be. It had to be of exponential order. Remember that we had put that restriction on. Oh, together. for this port. Okay. For this to work. Thank you. What about the negative on the one over s minus k? You're multiplying it by the negative. One. Remember, this term is now going to zero. Mm -hmm. So your answer is this times negative one. Oh, uh, okay. That's yeah. Okay, so right off the bat, this is the first, we're going to have a handful, but our very first Laplace transform is on an exponential function. Now, that's not something you saw coming. So I'll write it off to the side. The Laplace transform on e to the kt is 1 over s minus k. Well, that's kind of crazy. Well, you know, what if, what if k was 0? Yeah, It'll still s. work. But then what would I be doing the Laplace transform of? One. The number one. And what would that be? One over s. Oh, that might be important. <laughs> Remember when you're first learning rules of logarithms and rules of exponential functions? Sometimes the zeros and ones were really, really powerful. So the Laplace transform of the number one is equal to one over s. That's actually a really powerful thing. Now, the f of s that doesn't have to be of exponential order. In fact, it's not going to be. You're just going to see a lot of S's in denominators for the most part. I'm sorry, what is S? I'm in the realm where I have functions of T. T is my horizontal axis. F of T is my vertical axis. I'm changing my coordinate system to a new coordinate system where S is now the independent variable and capital F of S is on the vertical axis. That's not that much different than a U sub in that sense. That I'm, I'm changing my independent variable from t to this new guy called s. So mathematicians are just like, eh, minus well, because why not? It's just, well, everything it I'm saying it. is valid. Now, there's a really important rule that we need. When you first learn limits, everything was fine if it was the limit of one thing. But what if it was the limit of a bunch of stuff? You did not want to look at the limit all at once. When you took a derivative of a bunch of stuff, you did not want to try to look at it all at once. You integrated a bunch of stuff. And, but then what'd you prove? The limit of a sum, sum limits. Limit of a derivative is, I'm excuse me, the derivative of a sum is the, sum of derivatives, the integral of a sum, sum of the integrals. Huh, all three of those have something in common from linear algebra. They're all linear transformations. I'm gonna to prove to you this is a linear transformation. And that's one of the most important aspects of this. Because if it's not a linear transformation, then for me to do the Laplace transform of a sum would be absolutely nightmarish to try to do an integration by parts with two or three things in a sum. Do you realize how hard that would be? I mean, you'd change your major, you'd run for the hills, and that would be wise. But we don't have to do that. So let me raise this. <laughs> if you remember the rules of a linear transformation, if I said, let me call T my linear transformation, then T of x1 plus x2 must be t of x1 plus t of x2. And secondly, t of k times x must be k times t of x. 
Gosh, those are the same rules as limits, derivatives, and integrals. So what we often said was, well, what if I write it this way? I'm a big fan of doing this. So the transformation of the linear combination is the linear combination of the transformations. You kind of kill two birds with one stone. Okay? This is one of the really critical things you did with linear. I had a conversation with someone this morning, and they were asking me a linear algebra question, and I was great. And, and I said, well, you, didn't you, you know, and I said, didn't you do this? No, no, we didn't do that. I go, well, did you do this? No, we didn't do that. Well, where did you have it? I had it here. When did you have it? Over, over intersection. Oh. <laughs> so did you do eigenvalues and eigenvalues? I, I can what? What? Linear transfer, what? What'd you guys do? Well, we solved systems of equations using a matrix. Said, yeah, you did that in ninth grade, so what else did you do? I'm like, <laughs> what else is there? <laughs> well, that made me really happy knowing that if you're taking Math 254, it's 99.973% certain you have to take the upper division version for your major, and yeah, literally no chance if you didn't, especially if you didn't even get to eigenvalues and eigenvectors, including the complex versions and all that. Yeah, they, they did like chapter one, maybe chapter two. They said they did. He heard of he heard of a determinant. He's too good. Wasn't oh, sure yeah. what it was. Chapter one is. Zero. And of course, I said, "What did you get?" An A. <laughs> Completely online. Oh, no, Asynchronous. Yeah, that, that stuff does make me happy. All right, let's prove that this is a linear transformation. So, how would I prove that? By doing the Laplace transform of I don't know. How about C one f of t plus C two g of t. You're going to like this because we don't actually have to integrate anything. <laughs> because if the definition of the Laplace transform is the improper integral, then I can go directly to this. Now, how does that help me? Well, I just need to do a couple of algebraic steps. I feel like I'm fine about doing that. <laughs> Is that true or false? Stare at that for a minute. True. All I did was distribute. And we know the integral of a sum is the sum, is of, the the sum of the integrals. So I'm going to pull the C1 out and write this as f of t e to the negative s t dt plus C2 times the integral g of t e to the negative s t dt. Hmm. But isn't the first one C1 times the Laplace transform of f of t plus what? C2 times the Laplace transform of g. And we have proved it. Why is that a good thing? Because I would like you to tell me the Laplace transform of, I don't know, how about 3 e to the negative 4t plus 6 e to the 2t. I'd like you to tell me this without doing any work. Three. Yes. Minus. One over s minus k. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you did the work. <laughs> He's giving me not slightly like head language. Right? I'm looking at your hair, trying to figure out what, it, what you're telling me. Each you. curl means a different. Well, thing. first of all, can I do this? Yeah. This might be instructive, just so we don't lose where we are. Yeah, that's using the linear transformation property. So I'm not worried, don't worry about simplifying your final answer. That, keep that out of the equation. If it simplifies, it simplifies. Don't, don't dwell on that. This is three times what? One over s plus four. S plus four. Six. One, one over, over s, s minus, minus two. two. Now, obviously, you're going to put those in the numerator. That's fine. If you want to make this one quotient, that's fine. But I have to have a restriction. S is greater than K. Mm. Mm. I have two different ones. One of them said S must be greater than K for positive or no negative. What's power. the first one say S has to be greater than? Four. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> that's of the form. S has to be greater that's than E to the KT. And what did S have to be greater than? I, I erased it. Oh, S has to be greater oh, than K. K right. Agreed? S is everybody clear with that? S has to be, so the first one says S has to be greater than? Negative four. Negative four. The second one says S has to be greater than? Uh, uh, two. 
Is this an or? Yeah. Or an and. 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 They both have to simultaneously be true. Yes. Hey, I have a question with that. Um, um, hold, hold that thought for a minute. Okay. If I did this on a number line, and I said, S is greater than negative four, and at the same time, S is greater than two. It's an and. That's just greater than two. So it's got to be greater than two, because the second one is not greater than, or is it? <laughs> no. S has to be both at the same time. So if it's both at the same time, then S has to be greater than two. Does everybody care that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we just simply, we put in our disclaimer. Oh, right, because if it was equal to, then you'd get an asymptote at that portion. Well, yeah, it can't be equal. That's, that would be true. That's now, was that hard to do, or is that actually pretty simple? No, that's, no. That's, that's how Laplace transforms are going to feel. As I learn the Laplace transform for each function, actually performing one, you're not going to integrate. You only integrate to get the first one. So I'm going to do one more, and then I'm going to give you a couple for now, because I, I don't want to spend time integrating everything. Um, in the textbook, the author gives you every single possibility of one, and then we derive them as we go kind of thing. But this is one of those areas where I'm going to ask you to accept without proof a couple things, knowing we're going to prove it later. Here's what I like in it too. In Calc 1, I proved the derivative of x to the n is n x to the n minus 1 for positive integer n. And I proved that, and I have to use the binomial expansion, x plus delta x to the n. I expand it. I formally proved that. Then I do a proof for x to the negative n, where n's an integer, because that proof has the other proof embedded in it. So now I can prove the derivative of x to the n for every integer. And then I ask people to accept the truth for all real numbers, knowing they're going to see rational numbers in about three days when I do implicit differentiation. And then I prove, if it's a fraction, I'm using implicit, it's actually way easier because you don't even need limits. Then when we get to logs, I can prove it for all real numbers. But at the beginning of Calc 1, when we're first doing that derivative on about the third or fourth day of class, I say, I'm going to prove it for integers. I'm going to ask that you accept that it's true for everything else, knowing the proof is going to come later. And I, I usually have very few people stomp their feet and leave and say, no, no, I will not accept that. You've got to show me now. And I can't show you now, right? Not yet. There's a few things in between. And then when we get there, everyone says, well, I already knew what the answer was, but now it's really easy to understand. I'm going to ask you to accept a few of the results because some of them we're not going to prove till later. The particular one we're not going to prove till later is the most complicated, and that's the t to a power. That's actually the hardest one because it doesn't actually involve parts. Can you imagine I want to do the Laplace transform for t to the n? Imagine n is large. Well, if n was a large power, and oh, imagine n's not even a positive integer. We actually can't use parts. So in other words, there's a completely different way we do it that doesn't involve parts. But we won't know that until the fourth class. So some of the ones I'm going to let you have now, and the other ones we're going to show along the way. Okay? I'm going to do cosine. I could do sine. doesn't matter. I'm going to do cosine, and then I'm going to let you have sine, because the derivation for the sine is real similar. Real similar. Now, I'm going to bring it back to something in Calc 2. When you first learned parts, you didn't mind parts. There was only one you didn't like. <laughs> you, didn't like you didn't like ones like this. How come? It repeats. Because you got to do it more than once and bring things back together and manipulate. But there was one that was way worse than this one. This, this, this is easy. There's one that's way worse. No. <laughs> that's the worst one. Oh, God, now i got to keep track of those. Yeah, there's, this one's hideous. I hate this one. But it, you know, this we filled the board up. We're going to do a little plus transform, and it's going to look real similar. I hate to tell you, it's going to have a lot of the same algebra. So let's do the Laplace transform of, shall we, cosine of kx. We will reserve k as our constant. So we're going to do e to the kx, sine of kx, cosine of kx. We're just going to. So we always have k's in our formula set. Um, could we use e to the i kx? That, and, that won't help in this case. Because oh. you're going to have you can have an imaginary result from your integral that's, it's, uh, yeah, unfortunately, no, this is going to look like the calc 2. Oh, okay. it, it will look just like the calc 2 problem. I'll walk you through it. And remember, because we're taking limits as we go, a lot of times some of the terms end up being zero. 
There's, there's a lot of stuff going on, but like in the last problem, you're going to be taking limits of exponential things where the exponents, you know, the denominator, all that kind of stuff. So this is the integral from 0 to infinity, cos kx, e to the negative st dt. We're going to do the... We're going to do the general antiderivative and then come back because it's a little bit easier that way. Both of these are transcendental functions. In this case, does it truly matter which one is the u and which one's the dv? No. In fact, there's no advantage one way or the other. You're going to get the same answer regardless. You all know that. Some people say, I, I just always like doing this one as the e. You're going to take two derivatives or two antiderivatives. It's, there's no advantage either way. So I know this is equal to the limit as c goes to infinity of 0 to c. All right, I will come back to this in a little bit. So now, let's do the general antiderivative because I think it's too much to keep track of. Now, this is what I just said was the evil one a moment ago. You have, you don't just have a t, you have a constant times t. And that constant's probably not going to be a 1. All right, so it doesn't matter which one is my u, and it doesn't matter which one's my dv. I just have to be consistent, if you remember. All right, so we will let... All right, I'll, I'll, I'll let you choose. What do you want your u to be? E to, uh, actually, no, cosine. Cosine k. Yeah, cosine. Okay. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. So then our dv is e to the negative t to t. Our du is negative k sine so I can, I'll put it in front just to save myself some time and the v is negative e to the negative t and e t sorry okay so negative uv um, I'll keep them in the same order minus the negative so plus Integral. Oh, actually, they're both negative, so no, it'll still, it'll still be a minus. Now, what do you want to do with the k? Question. Inside the, the cosine argument should be kx? Should, K oh. K. No, they, oh, you know what? These, my bad, they should all be t's. <laughs> they, they, you, asked, you, you caught the wrong thing, but you're right. These should all be t's. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, X would present an entirely different set of problems here. Those should all be T's. Let me make sure. You need to take the double. Can we screw that up any worse? Uh, okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> can't say I've done that before. All right. I probably have. I just don't remember. That's what happens when you get old. Not that you make mistakes, but you just don't remember any of them. It makes it easier. All right. So, UV minus V to U, but both of those are negative, so this is still going to be a negative, isn't it? Now, what do you want to do with the k? You want inside the integral or outside? Oh, wait. Should the dv be e to the negative st? So then the v. What did. Oh, jeez, please. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, you are right. I'm not making mistakes on purpose. Probably. I'm reaching too high and the oxygen is not making it all the way to the top, I think. So this is e to the negative st, but what's in front? 1 over, one over right. Good, Good catch. God, that one. You know, here's the worst part. I know what the answer is, and then we get halfway through and go, this ain't working. Never had that happen before. Okay, a couple times. Yeah. All right, I think we're finally there. So, the UV, we have K's and S's for the purposes of integration are constants. T is the only variable within the integration. Do you want the K's and S's inside the integral? Do you want them outside the integral? Outside. Probably on the outside, they're not in the way then. So, that will be minus what? K over S. K over S. And then it'll be sine. Sorry about that. Boy, at least you guys are sharp. Oh, there's a 1 over s missing on the very front. And, oh, and this should have, see, minus, yes, that should be a minus 1 over s. There go. Turns out that's the only one that's not going to matter in the long run, but we want to get it right. <laughs> so now I've got to do a parts again. Now, if you were in Calc 2, you remember doing this problem, go, well, let me now switch. Now let's call u the exponential and dv the trig function. And what will happen when I do that? Mm, Does anybody yeah. know what's going to happen? You're going to go exactly back to where you're You're going to get that the answer to this integral is itself, and you undid all of everything. Up. Everything yeah. cancels. And no, you can't switch now. It never mattered what you started with, but you have to stay in the same order. If I switch the u and the dv here, all work is undone, and I get the integral equals itself. And if you ever did that in Calc 2, you'd realize, oh, yeah. 
just filled up half a page and <laughs> didn't get anywhere. And that feels very below average. Okay. So we're going to do it again. And I'm only looking at the integral, not any of the other stuff. So I'm going to choose u to be the sine function, like we just said. dv is going to be e to the negative st dt. du is k cos k t dt. And v is negative 1 over s e to the negative st. So I will rewrite the first part. minus k over s, and now it's being multiplied by the uv minus integral v du. This is definitely on the outside. I'll bring this down a little bit. So now, uv, so negative 1 over s, sine kt, e to the negative st, minus the integral of v du. So now that's going to be a plus, isn't it? Plus k over s, cosine kt, where are we, um, sorry, v, the integral of v du, so like that, and e to the negative st dt. <laughs> now, do I see the same integral that I started the problem with? Yeah. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a great thing. That's a great thing because it, it has a different coefficient. If the coefficient on that one was a positive one, now I'm screwed because they'd cancel out the problem. That means I royally mess this up. But that coefficient is that. So I'm going to throw it on the other side and just add coefficients. So if you remember, that's what you did in Calc 2. That's why this one gave you trouble sometimes because there's, we're done with the calculus. But it's the algebra now. So let's now continue on the right side. So I've got the integral of cos kt e to the negative st dt is equal to, okay, it's equal to the first one, 1 over s cosine kt e to the negative st uh, minus k over s times this. So what's that? That's, yeah. everybody with me? Plus k over s squared. There's a negative missing of the 1 over s cosine uh -oh. kt. Yeah, well, on the very, very first. first term. Yeah. Because in the equal sign in the blue, it kind of just likes like three. Oh, up. oh, 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 oh. You're right. You're right. Yeah. You're right. There's a. Yeah. Let me. So that should be a negative. Okay, good. Good. Okay. Um, the rest is okay, isn't it? Plus k over s squared. Sine kt e to the negative st, then what? Minus k squared, Minus k squared, over, s squared. over s squared, integral cosine kt e to the negative st dt. So we're going to add that to that. Does, it, does that look okay, everybody? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. I'm going to add this to both sides, which means my coefficient is going to be this. Let's make that into one quotient. It'll be a little bit cleaner. So now I'm going to have s squared plus k squared over s squared times the original integral. Yeah, this is all a big yikes. And that's going to equal just those two terms now. I don't want to factor anything out. OK, everybody cool with that? So now I can finally say the integral. We haven't even evaluated it yet. We're just doing the integration. I'm not worried about the, any plus c term because we're going to be doing a definite integral. So it's irrelevant. I'm now going to multiply both sides by what? S squared over the S reciprocal squared. of this. So if I multiply by S squared over, then that will be what? Negative S over S squared plus K squared cos KT e to the negative ST. 
When I multiply it over, the S squareds will cancel, won't they? And I'll get plus K over S squared plus K squared sine KT. I think we're good. Are we good? Make sure I didn't, I didn't mess this up too bad. Okay. Does everyone agree now the antiderivative of this is this? Okay. This is, that's straight Cal 2, isn't it? Yikes. Now we're going to evaluate it, and we're going to do the whole limit from zero. So I'm going to, I'm going to cheat and just go ahead and write that down now. So the zero to C, the limit as C goes to infinity. Give myself some room here. Limit as C goes to infinity. Zero to C. Now here's what I like. The zero part's easy. Do you agree the zeros are going to be easy? Why? One, one, zero. Zero. So that's the only one that's going to be left over when I do the, the zero. And when I do the infinity, I have something that's bounded between negative one and one multiplied by something that's approaching zero rapidly. Something that's bounded between negative one and one multiplied by something that's approaching zero rapidly. Does everybody understand those terms are going to zero? All I'm left with then is that guy. But it's the infinite, which would be the zero, minus the this. And on this side, it'd be the infinite, which is zero, minus this, which is also zero. That's the answer. That's why we had to get it into this form at the end. <sighs> that was trivial. That was yeah. trivial, wasn't it? <laughs> Literally. So, whoops, I already wrote it up here. Let me, let me rewrite it here. I need a disclaimer. Well, this isn't S minus anything, it's just an S. I need this to go to zero. That's only going to happen if S is greater than K. Greater than K. K. No. There was K there. Negative. Oh. Greater than one? Just greater than Oh, greater than zero. How about greater than zero? Yeah, greater than zero. I just need the exponent to be negative. Yeah. Oh, so K S just has to be greater than zero, doesn't it? Wow. Now, this one was gnarly. All right, I'm going to give you about 90 seconds. I want you to derive the sine function. <laughs> my name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, or I'll give you that one. How's that? <laughs> Turns out the derivation looks like this. It's just when I'm doing my limits, it's going to be slightly different. You're never going to guess what the denominator is. Minus <laughs> nice. What? What? Why the game? Well, let's derive well, it. <laughs> if we, I, I'm giving you this one. If we did the derivation, literally, it's going to be the same number of steps. Most of the steps are going to look really similar. The right side won't look exactly the same because this is going to have a sign over here. But when we do all of this stuff, I'm going to have a K rather than an S. Okay. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to spare you from that. I did the cosine because you, now, you know the sign's going to look similar. If we were doing a calc 2 problem, this is calc 2, and I want to put the sine function instead of the cosine, you know step by step it's going to have the same form, yeah. and you know the final answer is going to be real similar, right? Yeah. You know the final answer is going to be real similar, but pretty much those two things are going to be switched is the only thing that's going to happen. So I'm going to give you that one. That one's, those are the gnarliest ones, okay? And I'm going to give you one more. Um, when I say giving to you, I'm going to, in other words, I'm going to let you have these without proof for now because the proof isn't going to come till later. And that, let me do up here, that's the T. And is an element of the integer? No. I, I can only use this for, for positive integers. Oh, that's what that is. Technically, I could use it for t to the zero, but that's one, and we already have one, yeah. so what I don't was, need that one. What was q again? Or I, what, I what was the set? Yeah. That's rational. That's rational. Okay. Thanks. Those are the positive integers. 
Yeah, DJ. Uh, you remember that we learned this in the middle. Uh, mm. And when is this valid? When n is an integer that's positive. Well, it's always, the restriction is always on x. This will be true for any. So the only one, by the way, it's always s greater than zero, except in the exponential case. Mm -hmm. E to the kx, s has to be greater than k. The rest of the time, pretty much, s just has to be greater than zero, which is fairly easy to remember that. Now, what we did earlier over here, this is really important. When you're doing the Laplace transform of multiple terms, Every one of them has their own individual restriction, but you only state one restriction overall, and it's the only restriction that they all have in common. What if we had a Laplace transform that dealt with a, a trig function and a t, or the other ones? E is, that, is that, well, actually, let's, let's do exactly that. Okay. In fact, let's not just do that, let's throw coefficients in there. No. Yeah. Coefficients are fun, right? Let's do a triple integral. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> but there is still another problem that we need to look at. But let's suppose I want to do the Laplace transform of how about um, 3t to the 4th minus 6 times the cosine of 2t plus 4 sine of 3t. Well, let's just get out of control. Let's do an exponential. Let's do all of our friends today. How's that? Uh, minus 8e to the negative 4t. Oh, we're having a party today. Or having a la party. A la party. Uh -huh. It took me a while to get that out. Here's the point. Can I write the answer as the next thing I write? Yeah. Yeah, because once you have the Laplace transformation, you don't re-derive them. I need, I need the derivative of sine and cosine, so let me go back to the limit definitions and re-derive them. No, you have them. There will be things you have to integrate along the way. But right now I'm saying I'm giving you the big four right now. Okay? I derived E, I derived cos, I'm handing you sine, I'm handing you the exponential, or the, the, the t to the power. And by the way, I'm only handing you t to a positive integer power. Turns out, what if that n is like a half or something? That's one of the gnarliest ones of all. That uh, is a homework problem in this section that is beyond us. I will derive that one in the fourth class because that's the first time we'll actually be using it to answer a question. So we don't need it yet. I said there's a lot of information. There's, there's probably too much information in the first section to try to make that one lecture. Now, what's this going to be? Three times what? Four, four factorial over eight. What factorial? Four, four factorial. factorial. Uh, oh, did I, yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. Four factorial, like, did you write the right one? It's over. S to the fifth power. S to the fifth. Minus six. Uh, S, over S over S squared, S squared plus four. four. I'm gonna, for just for the moment, I'm gonna write it as two squared. So if, when you're doing your notes, you might do that just so you know where it came from. <clears throat> yes, you're gonna write a four, of course. Plus four times K. S over S squared plus three squared. No, there's no K in the answer. What's K? It's a three. 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 <laughs> Your K is a three in that one. And then the last one, eight times one over S plus four. Yeah. Where? Yeah. S is greater than S zero. is positive. S is positive. S is positive. S is greater than negative four. Yeah. S is positive. S is greater than zero. Bo this one. Like, you remember how you said that if we look at a number line, one of them. We both have to be true at the same time, Just so where do they overlap? Pick the bigger number. Okay. Or so the I said, smaller? on this one, the answer was, we said the answer was s greater than 2. So choose. Yeah, that's They both have to be true at the same time. Yes, so can you, okay. can, can't you just say s is greater than negative 4, and then that includes the entire number line and? Well, then the question is, if I've got e to the negative s minus k in general, well, let's just say, uh, let's just keep it simple. I have e to the to that. And I said, right now we want s to be greater than 2. If you said, no, all we need is s to be greater than negative 4, we have a problem. Why? Because negative 4 minus 2, when I throw the negative in front, is now positive, and that goes to infinity. If I choose the smaller one, it'll go to infinity. Anybody catch the question, Dushantad? It's a good question. 
Why can't I use that one? Uh, because, it because then it makes it positive. Because then I would have a positive exponent. Yeah. I need the exponent to stay negative, and so I have to pick the biggest one of all my constraints. Yeah, so this was easy because all of them are zero except for the last one. Yep. So it's zero. That is wild. The smallest one makes the entire thing diverge. That's because it makes the e t it makes it e to the negative of a negative power o, which is positive, so it just blows yeah, up. Yeah, so it goes it goes out of control. I mean, dogs sleeping with cats the whole nine yards. It's it's yeah, <laughs> all hell breaks loose. It's it's Armageddon pretty much, you know, in a mathematical format. Okay, we want to do one more problem, and this is probably the seemingly the ickiest one, but from a calculus standpoint, it's actually not the highest level. You could probably argue it's, it's a lower level. It's we want to talk about a piecewise function. <laughs> People freak out. Piecewise, oh my goodness. Hey, piecewise. Well, piecewise, in, generally in calculus, piecewise is scary. OK? Let me grab one. Um, the one piece. It's just two. Did you say piecewise of a sum? Yeah. So let's say. <laughs> so good. So good. Let me throw in something kind of remotely fun. All right. Uh, this is. Um, how about it's it's four when I'm between there, and it's uh, e to the two t when t is. Greater than two. Okay. Yeah. I'm just throwing something at random out there. We should have all our friends in there. Cosine. cosine. Well, no, because no, we want to. I just want to show you how to set up a piecewise. Okay. The answer is not. I can. I cannot just answer this in one step. Yeah. But remember the definition. The Laplace transform of f of t. This guy's going to go to infinity, but this guy's just going to be 0 to 2, isn't it? You bet. Those are two. Different. So I'm going to have two integrals. I'm going to have 0 to 2 okay. of the number 4 e to the negative s t to t. That one's easy. And then what's the next one going to be? 2 to infinity. 2 to infinity. 0 to 2. <laughs> or no, infinity to 2. 2 to infinity. Uh, Okay, stare at that one. Do you want that? That's what it should look like. <laughs> okay. Because the, the e to the 2t is not 0 to infinity. It only starts at 2. So when we set this up, we went 0 to infinity, we integrated, and we got a nice, cool thing. Well, the first one's not even an improper integral. So let's do the first one. What's the antiderivative of this one? Negative 1 over s. s even. So it's, well, don't forget the 4. Oh, so four, negative 4, four, over, four s. over s. E to the, e to the negative s t from 0 to 2. So let me pull out this guy. So I have e to the negative what? I'm evaluating t. 2 s. Minus 1. Okay. okay. So could I write this as 4 over s? Oh, I thought that was a 5. <laughs> These are, yeah, I'll try to avoid 5s if I can. I was like 4 fifths. I was about to ask you where that came from. That's one of my, my biggest pet peeves is that 5s and, and s's. And you're like, oh, yeah. Okay. How do I write the next one? Put the order. Could I write it as 4 e to the negative 2s over s? Would that be okay? Yeah. Sure. Are there any restrictions on s? No, because s isn't going to infinity. That's it. That's the answer to the first part. The, the piecewise says that it can equal, no, that's sorry, that's for t. But s can't be 0. s cannot be 0? You're right. Yeah, so that's our restriction. Up. s cannot be 0. No. No, if I said f of x was 1 over x, do you all write, but x cannot be 0? Well, no, because that's for no, the... it's just not in the domain. That's the independent oh. term. I'm talking about like for the s. I, I don't, this is what we get. Can I evaluate this as 0? No, it'd be undefined. I don't have to put a restriction. Don't confuse that with, with the Laplace transform of this is this, but it's only this if s is greater than 2, because if s wasn't greater than 2, it would have diverged to infinity. 
That's not converging. That's what it is. I just did a simple integration. Oh, this isn't for wh where like our at or our that was a limit to defined. infinity. Mm. That was either going to be this makes it really easy. And you're taking the limit to infinity. You're either going to get zero or infinity, <laughs> depending on which side s is on. If s is on the other side of two, it's infinite. If it's on this side of two, it's zero. Those are your only two choices because the e is on the bottom for the negative exponent. I'm not going to infinity, so I don't have any restrictions here. Yeah, but s in the denominator. That just means s can't be zero. I don't have to state oh that. My you have a lot of functions that have variables in the denominator. You don't have to physically state the variable can't be zero. Okay, I just want to yeah. make, make sure. So you're saying that the s restrictions only go for when we have an improper interval going from some number to infinity. Yeah, because, because, that in because on one side it would be infinite, and you even said so yourself. On one side it's going to diverge, on the other it's going to converge to wow. zero. That's the best, right? That exponential term is zero or it's infinite. I thought that the s's were for like where the function of s is undefined. And I was just no, like, okay. No. Okay, how do I do the second one? Okay. Combine them and then put the all exponential. Negative s plus where? I, I basically e can the, do the entire process yeah. we did a moment ago, except one of the terms is not zero. Yeah. So everything we did before was correct. So right off the bat, I think we want to put this as e to the what? Negative, negative k s minus k. How about well, two? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to have the limit as c goes to infinity, right? All right. Two to c, e to the negative s minus two t. I think that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I've got limit as c goes to infinity of. Isn't that just going to be negative s to the negative s minus 2? Yeah. From 2 to c. That's the one that's going to go to 0 as long as s is bigger than 2. Right. Plus what? e to the 2 times s minus 2 because I'm replacing t with a 2. Well, this one's going to 0 as long as s is greater than 2. So all of this will simply be e. Like now, wait, what oh, should we have in the integral? integral? When you integral, you've got that 1 over Did s. I, yeah. wait, wait, what's the, the chain rule the, for, uh, part of the integral? Negative 1 over yeah. s. There's my chain rule right there. But um, what about the s? Oh, 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 oh I'm sorry. You're, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's an S minus. Uh, let's put the S minus. Let's put uh, yeah, the S minus two out here. Sorry about that. I was looking at the signs. So what have we got then? We have this, which is kind of weird looking. We're not sure what to do with that yet. Over S minus two. The other part's going to zero. Right. Can I distribute yeah. that? Can I? Does it make any difference? No. Will it combine with anything I already have? We can have a negative two. No. Did I just lose? I think I just lost some. I think that should be a. I think that should be a negative. Sorry. Um, I'm going to have a e to the negative two s over here. I have a e to the negative two s over here. Might I be able to do something with these? Well, not exactly because they have a different denominator. Yeah. But I want you to notice something about your answer. By the way, this is not a suggestion. It's just an observation. My answer is e to the, let's see, how can I say this in the easiest sense? Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's 1 over s minus 2 times e to the negative 2 s minus 2. Isn't that the answer we would have got if it went from 0 to infinity? Yeah. Yeah, is that useful to, well, no, but I'm seeing it in my final answer. Now, the difference is in the piecewise, you can't just tell me the answer. It's, it's not that easy. I feel like something's not quite right here. Negative one or something, that's okay. That one goes to zero. That's two. I think everything's fine. It just, it just looks kind of goofy to me. 
you have to do it in this form, but when you're doing the piecewise, the finite portion actually should be pretty simple. Now, you're only going to see, I'm, I'm gonna promise you this, you're only going to see piecewises of things where you already know the answer. And in the textbook, the author almost exclusively uses constants and like T, you know, things like that, things that'll make it easier. But the problem with using a T on the first one, now I have to do a parts, and that actually makes it kind of a long problem. So I'd rather, on this, I'd rather not do a T. I just think that makes it too long. Don't we just use the factorial answer? No, that, that, would, be, that would be From zero only if I have the whole thing. Yeah. If, if one of these was a T, this is a really gnarly problem. You actually would have to do the integration by parts. So if I have T to a power, I can't use the factorial thing because that was only the result if it's zero to infinity. Mm, but this is not zero to infinity. I, I'm exposing you to this. I will not, I have asked you a question on the quiz involving this. It's not a high level problem. That's not the point. It's to show you how do you do that. Well, why? When do we ever do piecewises? In Laplace transforms, we're actually going to do Laplace transforms of piecewises, and that actually becomes a really important thing. It, it exposes us to a whole nother branch of things we can do that we can actually do the integrations. Now, everybody knows what it means for function to be continuous. Okay, I would say you can drive through it. Differentiable is far more strict than continuous. Differentiable means your derivatives have to be continuous. So I can be continuous, right? I can have a cusp, continuous but not differentiable, okay? Differentiable is the toughest. The easiest is what's called integrable. It's actually a word, it's hard to say. Hmm. I can integrate with an infinite number of discontinuities. Yeah. How can you integrate with discontinuities? Because think of area under the curve. I don't have to be continuous. So I'm gonna give you one of the more important ones. You, you, we haven't done this, we will do this in this class here. Keep this real simple. If I said, what's the area under the curve? <gasps> Could you tell me? Yes. Yeah, it'd be really easy. <laughs> I gave you four little short segments that weren't connected. Does anyone know what this type of function is called? The step function? It's called a step function. Sometimes it's called the greatest integer, sometimes it's called the least integer, sometimes it's called a floor, 